an introduction. Um, so I had my first kiss underneath the bed while playing hide and go seek. I was 10 years old and I still think that's really impressive. <laughs> like, I feel like any bozo who can get a first kiss at 16 or 21 or 52, but like, you try smooching someone when you don't even have the concept of pubic hair yet? That's one charming 10 year old. <laughs> we were underneath the bed, me and this girl, and we were locked in this steamy makeout session. And there's a dust soaked mattress above me and the darkness was enveloping us. And I had this feeling in my stomach, the feeling of falling. And that's not a laugh point. <laughs> And I remember thinking, like, I've won. <laughs> like, I've beaten everybody. <laughs> I'm winning, I'm finally winning. <laughs> and then it was over, and all the kids got together and they decided that we were gonna play a different game. There's gonna be no more hide and go seek. And honestly, that decision didn't sit well with me. I wanted to keep on hiding. I, I'd seen the face of God and I wanted to keep on kissing it. So what I did was I announced that I was gonna screw their game. I was gonna go and hide by myself, hoping that the girl would come and hide with me and keep kissing me. So I went back under the bed and I hid and I laid there for 30 minutes and the mattress was still above my head and the darkness was all around me and there were sounds coming from the next room of kids playing past the parcel. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I don't think I'm winning anymore. <laughs> when I was 16, I, I spent this night drinking goon in a park with two girls in Bracken Ridge. <laughs> Um, and around midnight, the two girls went home and I realized I'd missed the last train and I was stranded in this hellscape of a suburb. Now, for those of you who haven't been to Brackenridge before, I just want to like, give you an idea of what it's like. I want to paint a picture in your mind. Um, picture in your mind right now the worst place you've ever been to. That's pretty much it. Um, I called my friend who lived in the area but he was at a movie marathon at Chermside. <laughs> but he, he told, he said, I know someone who can help you out. So a girl who I didn't know and her mum, who I also didn't know, came and picked me up from the side of a road at 1 a.m. and took me back to their house to sleep. I guess they were just really nice people. Like, um, the girls are kind of, like, they're kind of beautiful that only a stranger can be. Like, she had olive skin and dark brown hair, and she kind of, like, she had the air of her, like, she was way out of my league, and she knew it, which I found irresistible. <laughs> when we got back to her house, um, she put on the movie Beavis and Butthead do America. <laughs> Great film. <laughs> and halfway through this comedic masterpiece, my hand accidentally touched her hand and she didn't move her hand away and so I kissed her and she kissed me back and it was great, except she had a bit of a garlic breath, but it was great besides that. The next morning, I kind of got the vibe that she didn't want that to ever happen again, ever. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I was overthinking it, I'm not sure. Um, I tend to overanalyze things sometimes, but there are a couple of signs. Like, for instance, at breakfast, she never looked at me, and when I asked her a question, she gave grunted, or she'd give a one-word answer. And once her mum joked, kind of saying something like, Oh, Jenny, are you sad because your boyfriend's about to leave? 
And the girl, Jenny, said, he is not my boyfriend. <laughs> Later that day, I talked to my friend who was at the movie marathon and told me everything that happened. And he said, dude, you gotta go back. And I said, um, I uh, don't think, and he said, dude, trust me. And he called her and told her that I was stranded in Bracken Ridge again. <laughs> I only heard one side of that conversation, but like it seemed to me like there was too much convincing on his end. He had to convince her too much for my taste. When I got to her house, <laughs> this is the train wreck that is my life. When I got to her house, I got the sense that no one wanted me there. Kind of like when you go into a restaurant five minutes before it closes and everything is perfectly clean. Her mom kept teasing her, kept saying, that I was her boyfriend. And the girl kept saying, he is not my boyfriend. Angrier and angrier, until dinner was over, and she stormed out and slammed the door of her bedroom behind her, and I was alone. And I went to where my bedroom was, in the living room on a couch, and there was another man there, her uncle, who was also sleeping over on the other couch, and this wasn't how I wanted the night to go. Like, this wasn't my dream scenario. All I wanted at this point was to get out of there. But he stayed up all night, this uncle of hers, watching soccer on the TV and engaging me in chit chat about soccer. I don't like soccer, I don't understand soccer, I can't talk about soccer. What I'm talking, what I'm describing to you now is a recipe for the most awkward night of your life. Someone who take notes. At 3 a.m., the uncle finally fell asleep and I slunk out, wandered the streets of Bracken Reef until the sun rose. And it was bright out and there was a moon in the sky and the street lights hadn't been turned off yet. And I remember thinking, you really learned something today, Stephen. <laughs> When I was 18, my girlfriend of two years broke up with me over the phone. I can't remember exactly why. She had some bullshit reasons that were definitely true. <laughs> but I remember I was devastated. The next day I went up to her house and I tried to convince her to take me back. I cried, I begged, I argued. And eventually I cracked her and she told me that she had slept with someone the night before after we broke up. Yeah, brutal. And, and I stormed out of the room, stomp, feet stomping, swearing, slamming the door behind me. The perfect storm out. The kind of storm out I only ever thought was in movies before. Like the kind of storm, storm out I'm gonna tell my grandchildren about in 50 years. And it was kind of great. I got about halfway down the street before I realised that I'd left my wallet in her room. <laughs> now, if that happens to me now, like, I, that wallet isn't mine anymore. Like, that wallet's dead to me. It's behind enemy lights and I am a coward. I would get a new ID, new go-cards, start afresh with all my loyalty cards. That's it. But I wasn't me, I was young and I was dumb and I slunk back into that room and I opened the door and I tiptoed in and I reached over her. She was crying. I reached over her, <laughs> grabbed my wallet from the bedside table and I tipped, oh, and I said, I'm sorry. And, <laughs> and I tiptoed back out and I gently shut the door so it didn't make a noise. Three months later, my ex called me, and she asked if I wanted to meet up for drinks as friends. And I said, sure. 
And every part of me was saying, no. <laughs> See, I think like people never change. I feel like every relationship, every kiss, every handheld, every romantic viewing of Beavis and Butthead to America, <laughs> carve themselves, carve a, carve, carve a pattern into us that we can't escape from. And the pattern I had noticed in myself at this point was that any time a girl showed me interest, I would cling to her like, cling wrap and I would return I would return and I would return no matter how embarrassing it got I think what they call that is having no self-worth um, <laughs> and now I really do think that no people can't really change but then I was 18 and I had dyed black hair cut into a fringe over my face, and I had an Atreyu shirt that was two sizes too small, and skinny jeans, and black converses, and a heart full of true pain, and I felt like everything had to change. Which is bar called Rosie's? Um, For those of you who never went to Rosie's, I'm gonna try and paint a picture of it for you. Picture in your mind right now, Brackenridge. <laughs> you got it. My ex and I, we drank and we talked and we talked for so long that eventually she told me that she loved me and that she couldn't live without me and I said, all right. And then we kissed. That was good. And then afterwards she said, I'm so glad that we're back together. And I said, we're not back together. And she slapped me. And she stormed out. The perfect storm out. <laughs> I drank a couple more beers and then I went outside and it was raining and I was undercover but a few stray droplets were carried by the wind to me and across the road there was a street light and I watched the rain fall underneath it and I felt like the whole rest of my terrifying future was out there beyond that light and there was a small part of me that was ecstatic that I hadn't got back together with my ex a small part that was proud that I had gone across this pattern I'd seen in myself, but I couldn't help but think that I still didn't feel like I was winning. <laughs>